and it's John Reed, and look who I dragged into an empty conference room at Acumatica Summit. What's up? Oh, no. <laughs> Brian Summer, thank you in advance for your leadership. Uh, thank you for your leadership and <laughs> setting this up, John. And we've been uh, pushing out the hashtag for thank you for your leadership quite we extensively have. at this show. We have. A lot of people have been thanked. I'm not sure they've always lived up to the congratulations they've received. But. And I... I got to tell you, it was a real thrill to walk up here yesterday uh, at the reception and two people uh, buttonholed me immediately. I didn't even recognize them, but they were at the Acumatica show like two or three years ago Yeah, yeah. when we put thank you for your leadership on the map. And they came over and yeah. started shaking my hand, thanking me thanking for my you leadership. once again. It, it's the uh, gift that keeps on giving. <clears throat> yep. It's the laurels. We, we've earned one way or the other whether we actually deserve them is a whole nother discussion right but we're actually um we're on the the final sort of day you're heading out shortly uh of the acumatica summit event which was, has been growing every year uh for those listeners who aren't familiar acumatica rising cloud erp player if you will uh yeah, so let's put that in perspective uh a few years back and i mean it was just a few years back a bunch of folks get together to create kind of a, a replacement for the Microsoft Solomon business. Right. And in just a matter of a few years, they went from a couple of resellers and partners to picking up a pile of them. And um, now you're, we were at a conference by my count, and I'm not putting this up for like the same kind of attendance yeah. calculations as the uh, inauguration of recent days. But it looked like... Um, my guess is over 600, maybe right. as high as 800 people have been at this event, which right. is remarkable in the short amount of time the company's been right. around. A lot of partners because Acumatica does all of its sales through partners, but increasing amount of customers attend this event. I believe they said around 20, is it 20, 25%? I think customers this year, something like that. Yeah, um, I think uh, by my math, I think they said there were 80 customers. I don't know if that was mm. accounts or that was people. Yeah. But that would work out to probably 15, 20% of the audience maybe could have been, could yeah. have been customers. Yeah. So what are we learning? Well, uh, right off the bat, I'd have to tell you that there were a lot of happy customers, which is good to see. Mm -hmm. uh, it's never any fun to cover an analyst uh, or, excuse me, user conference when there's a whole bunch of angst and fury going on. True. So these are all very happy people. Apparently, the partners are doing a pretty good job of, keep, you know, getting them installed, installed quickly and installed cheaply. Acumatica doesn't seem to be gouging them either on uh, user cost or license, or not license, well, license fees and user seat cost and all that. That seems to be a good thing. Well, yeah, the, a lot of customers talk about the flexible licensing in the sense that you, you don't pay per seat. Uh, you pay based on usage and a lot of customers right. like that. And that was, a, you know, that was a theme. Um, you and I both interviewed at different times a customer who had uh, moved off of NetSuite. And um, because they were a high growth company, those costs were growing and growing yeah. and become very material. So that is a key point. But again, the bottom line, the mood's fairly happy. And the other thing that's interesting maybe for your listeners is that um, on some of the more complex deals, Acumatica sends its own technical people to stand behind the integrator to make sure the deal's going to go well. Yeah, which is really important because uh, a flawed integrator leads to a bad project. I mean, we've known that ever since the mid-'90s. Right. And with Acumatica, the risk of that could potentially be higher in the sense that you're very dependent on that partner a lot of times, but Acumatic, I think, is doing a better job of making itself available to customers. They don't get in a tough spot with a partner that's not a good fit, and and part of it is just the support and collaboration that they try to sh show their customers seems to be paying off. Uh, mostly hear good feedback about their accessibility when they're needed and stuff like that. Yeah, and so, this, this is a telling point, though, in the evolution of a software company. When they're in, still in high growth mode, they need to be extraordinarily customer experience focused. Yeah. And that is not the time to be caught constantly keeping both your fist in the customer's back pocket, trying to steal them blind and not delivering well on the implementations. This is when you need to really manage the integrators or the channel partners and the like. There is this terrible thing, though, that does happen with a lot of software companies. Once they hit sort of uh, the apex of their growth, then they switch from being an innovation firm and uh, customer experience focused one to being a money grubbing. Uh, yeah. We're going to grab all the cash we can and milk this cash cow into the grave. Yeah. And that'd that, be pretty depressing if that happens. 
Yeah, but we see that all the time, too. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah, it's true. Um, so our listeners will, I think, enjoy some of the multi-cloud stuff I want to talk to you about because that goes well beyond Acumatica. But before we get there, I think we need to revisit just briefly Acumatica's target market because uh, for a couple of years now, John Roskill, CEO, has been emphasizing the abandoned mid-market is the place where he sees Acumatica doing – uh, making hay, I guess you could say, because a lot of companies are moving up in the market. I mean, that's been pretty intentional from a NetSuite standpoint, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but we're seeing, I think, some clarity, or, or at least you and I were talking about that. What are your thoughts on ab- abandoned mid market? Well, uh, lots of vendors are going to, wherever they come in in a market, they're generally going to move up and down market as mm. uh, time progresses just to expand the addressable market their products can serve. That's just the evolution of the business. Uh, this product, again, because it started by a bunch of like former Solomon types, I think came in at a space that was a little bit more sophisticated maybe than the Quicken, QuickBooks kind of customer. And they've continued to expand functionality to move it up market. Now, where I keep tweaking John Roskill, the CEO, about is I think his definition of mid-market doesn't in any way match up with mine. I think it's more aspirational, maybe, what he's got than mm. um, delivered. Yes, he's got customers. He's got a lot more of them this time. They may have 50 to as high as, I think, 350 employees. Right. But that will give you an idea of, I think, the typical customer here could be anywhere from, I've, I've talked to them that have five employees and all the way up yeah. to about 50. So uh, is that mid-market? Uh, I'm not Totally. It's on the low end of it. Well, when you and I were talking with John over lunch informally on the first day, we talked about, it seemed to me that however you wanted to find the mid-market, I mean, he certainly said that we don't fit Gartner's definition of the mid-market, which is what, like 5,000 employees or whatever. Fine. Um, It does seem like they do want to go up market a bit more than they are now. Yeah. Uh, and if that's the case, they, they will have growing pains. John pretty much admitted as much because they're going to need a different kind of partner Correct. for those accounts and that they have right now. Um, and they're aware of that. Um, so that'll be interesting to follow. Yeah. And he did, in, he did off the record kind of indicate that they're talking to some additional kinds of partners mm-hmm. that would have more um, capabilities for like longer, bigger kind of implementations, more complex because things. Because it's not off the record anymore. Uh, <laughs> well, he, he mentioned a name. I'm not going to yeah, do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, we're, that we're, part I kept off the record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other piece of that is the cloud ERP adoption trends in the mid-market, which seem to be going pretty strong. Um, what are your thoughts on on this multi-cloud business because this is where I think this is a really interesting talking point for Acumatica because they have, they've been talking about this for a while now and trying to, I think be a pretty open platform in terms of, I've talked to a lot of customers who told me how easy it is to work with their APIs and such and how well documented they are, which basically is a reflection of the fact that a lot of these customers, even in the mid market are probably starting to run like four to six different cloud projects. They need to be able to integrate them. They don't want to deal with vendors that force them to, to buy only their suite of schlock, right? They, <laughs> they want to choose what they want. Um, and the Salesforce one's a great example of that because while I think some customers in the mid market find Salesforce a little, uh, over the top, perhaps for them, maybe too pricey. Um, today, Acumatica demoed a, a so-called seamless integration with Salesforce based on customer requests for that. Um, but at the same time, Acumatica wants to expand its own CRM customer base. So what are your thoughts just in general on those issues? I think uh, it would be – all we've got to do is tear a page out of the history books and look at what happened in the on-premise world. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you had – acquired every module from a major ERP vendor, you still had to integrate it with other uh, applications, whether custom built or package, because no one vendor can give you all of the coverage you need in all functional areas all the way around the world for every kind of business model that you operate in and so forth. So integration is, a it, you know, it is reality. And this cloud to cloud kind of integration that you're talking about, I think is absolutely um 
vital. Now, in the early days when everybody was connecting stuff together using things like Boomi, cast iron, and product Informatica right. and things like that, there's still going to be a, a great need for that. I'm not dismissing that at all. In fact, it's going to continue to grow. But what customers want more and more is a tighter degree of integration. They don't want to have to uh, be passing. They don't want the latency of data moving from one cloud service to another. Right. They want uh, they want the functionality embedded within the application of, of a vendor like Acumatica. They want it to be brainless and seamless, I guess, for the users. And they want all the linkages to stay working 24-7, 365. Uh, so right. That's the uh, that's what's behind this, and I think these guys are at least smart enough and not not so full of themselves to assume that everything in the world must integrate to them and to their right. m- monolithic giant suite. They know the world is a more um, mixed group of applications people are going to have, and they're creating that kind of a environment. Yeah, they did that with the DocuSign demo as well, where they were trying to integrate DocuSign capabilities into the workflow, which is where you want it. You don't want to have to open DocuSign as a separate app and dick around with that. Yeah, and they they even showed that with a, a new HR product that has they've added to their um, their list as well. Right. Yeah. Now we also have the this other aspect of bin market ERP, which is. I think it's going to need to be, if they, especially if you want to move up, you're going to need to have industry specialization. I don't, I just don't think that generic ERP is going to cut it anymore. And we've seen a little bit of that from Acumatica because last time you and I did a podcast, we were under NDA, but now they've released the the field service edition and the commerce edition. Thoughts? Right. Uh, the commerce deal was pretty interesting, particularly since they've. I, I know I was able to talk to a customer, I think the same one I think you did as well, uh, that's using a lot of that technology. Yeah. And um, uh, let's face it, there's, if you want to point to a segment where there's a lot of growth in new businesses coming out in the economy, it's a lot of either um, web commerce kinds of companies or even some of the um, – traditional even mom and pop stores are adding a e-commerce capability to their space. Uh, they need what they need is a really cost effective solution to handle that kind of stuff. And they need kind of as much as possible in from one vendor to make it really work because these companies just don't have the IT staff or anything else to make it happen. Mm. Um, I know the one big one that they talked to us about besides the IT director, I think they had one or two other IT people and that's the total IT complement. They need to, those folks need to be focused on, um, on creating additional competitive advantage opportunities for the company, not keeping everything stitched together. That's non-value added time, and that's what's got to be removed. So I think this will actually get a nice warm reception. Pricing of it actually may help them in continued wins against NetSuite, who also has a very strong e-commerce right. omni-channel solution. And is the competitor that they see the most in deals based on the session I went to, something like 34% that they run into Net- NetSuite. So Yeah. It's on, shall we say? Yeah, I'm sure we'll. I'll hear from our good friends in uh, uh, at Netsuite about this uh, podcast. But anyway, hey, uh, you know, I always feel like customers need the most choice from the most products. I'm not about endorsing one or the other. So uh, we should probably also mention of note Acumatica's penetration of the cannabis industry. Well. <laughs> I defer to your expertise on this, John. Uh, I'm no. talking to one of the customers later today. Um, evidently, and, and, you know, I give Acumatic a credit for seizing an opportunity there because obviously there are legal means of, of doing this type of business now in certain states. Yeah. And, and it turns out to be a fairly complex undertaking that requires fairly sophisticated software. So there you go. Yeah, and and also what's remarkable is this is a company with 350 employees. So this is not the small business. You not think some, it, this, they're, no, this and is, they're in a high uh, this high growth, no pun intended, industry as well. Uh, this so. isn't your your uh, uh, tool tool uh, listening cousins like underground like pot garden with like two employees like running purple lights. You know, this is like a big time operation. Yeah. Well. Um. It is big time. I mean, 350 employees is not an inconsequential kind of business, not at all. And 
if I remember right, they went straight to Acumatica from spreadsheets, right. from what I heard on the uh, customer panel this morning. So, yeah, that's a, that was a different kind of vertical. I don't think any of the analysts here were expecting uh, to hear a big story on that. Yeah. And then uh, the final thing, they, they showed off some kind of new stuff that was really more futuristic. They wanted to give their customers some idea of the possibilities. Yeah. Uh, one of that included a blockchain uh, integration demo with Acronis for uh, invoice uh, validation. Mm -hmm. So a non-financial blockchain use case that was also... Of course, um, the inevitable Alexa demo, which yes. we're going to see a lot of this year, that we may need to tape a podcast about that. And then chatbots as well. Mm -hmm. But no drones. So there was, they, they, they skipped the drones. But yeah, we could probably give them a, a shopping list of other doodads they need to bring at next year's event. One thing that's been on my mind, and I'm going to investigate this a little bit after you head on your plane, but I'm curious to just get your quick thought on it. What do you think about? So I talk with a few customers who really like the fact that Acumatica has pretty flexible deployment options. So even though Acumatica is a multi-tenant software product, unlike other multi-tenant SaaS ERP products, they offer flexible deployment options. And so you can go back and forth. So for example, I was talking to a customer that is in the SaaS deployment, but they want to bring bring their deployment essentially to a private AWS instance, so private cloud. Uh, on the panel today, we heard more from another customer that likes that option. They like having the private cloud. Um, and then another that might move there. That all, that flexibility sounds like, at this point, an advantage. I'm just wondering if there's going to be issues down the road as far as the scale of that. The biggest issue with this is... Um I, I get the flexibility argument, okay, but it's flexibility for what purpose? Mm. I mean, are these companies really thinking about um, making frequent moves in and out, like a, an AWS center to a to an on premise uh, device? Well, like for that? example, the customer I talked with last night, they have data privacy issues in their business, mm -hmm. and they want to combine. Uh, for analytical purposes, Acumatica data with other data stores that have other confidential mm -hmm. information in them, and they feel a lot more comfortable doing that in a private cloud environment, right or wrong. That's yeah, what yeah, they well, want. Okay, and, I, and my advice, my counsel to your listeners is dig into how the data is secured on the mm -hmm. public cloud deals, because to me, I think, I think where we're at right now in the evolution of this uh, industry in this space is – the stuff is actually extraordinarily well secured in even public clouds. Right. So the question you have to ask is, are, is your data center and or your other options, uh, are you actually able to deliver superior security at an even lower cost? And, uh, while again, I get the, the argument about we have flexibility. But again, I think your, your starting point ought to be we're going to do stuff first in the public right. cloud until you prove to me otherwise. Yeah. And if you haven't done the homework to check out the security capabilities of the uh, public cloud side, then I don't think you've done your due diligence. Right. And and I, I know from the past talk with Acumatica, and I'll talk to them more about this today, but that the majority of their customers, their new ones, are all signing on to their SaaS product. Mm -hmm. But it just kind of made me wonder as far as like, as company continues to grow, is that flexible aspect going to become somewhat problematic for them in terms of maintaining all the instances? Okay, so and on that end, uh, it, it would behoove Acumatica and its customers to get more and more of them on uh, public cloud where they can do one single upgrade, if you exactly. will, and uh, at a much lower co delivery cost for everybody involved. Yeah. And you don't want to be the kind of customer who's on some orphaned, uh, system or site and falling behind on releases and patches or making mm -hmm. it more expensive for a vendor like Acumatica to patch it for you, uh, or you're going to have to do it yourself. And how any of that saves you money, I can't, I can't see that at all. Well, that's, uh, that's a story to watch then. And it's, it's good. I mean, we don't want to 
present this company like they've got it all figured out. They got a lot still to figure out. And I think that's one issue they're going to have to continue to grapple with. Yeah. I mean, well, again, we said at the top of the call, it's a relatively new company that's undergoing a lot of growth and kudos to them for, you know, for having the guts to experiment with things like blockchain and other technologies. I mean, a lot of other folks would still be trying to demonstrate like a seventh way to allocate a balance in the general ledger. Right. You know, oh, kill me now. Uh, you know, they're actually working on stuff that's a little bit more cutting edge. And that's really where you want to see the focus of this stuff going on. And do they have it all figured out? Well, no, a lot of this was coming right out of the, like uh, skunk works. And they're using that to socialize it with the partners in the audience and get feedback on it that'll further shape the product. I actually view that as a good sign. Plus, they invite the likes of you and me and Frank Scavo here and essentially let us run amok. Um, and that's that's something I wish more vendors did. I mean, they're really pretty free and open with us, which is how it should be. Yeah. So. Vendors, if you're listening, that's how to get good coverage. Uh, make it free and open. That's the biggest thing. Let us let us barge into customer sessions and ask awkward questions, which Brian Summers famous for, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, that's a whole nother podcast. Thanks for joining me, Brian. Happy to do it. Thanks, John. Bye.